Open your cerebral cortex and shift your lobes into upper beta phase because you are going to have Bitcoin knowledge transmitted directly into your vestibulocochlear. Your host at Bitcoin Knowledge is Trace Mayer, an early Bitcoin advocate since it cost a quarter, but this is not intended to be investment advice. A doctor of jurisprudence, but this is definitely not legal advice. And an investor in core cryptocurrency infrastructure, including Armory, BitPay, Kraken, and Mitagio, but this is not a recommendation of those services. Here, you get fed via direct mind download with pure and free Bitcoin knowledge. Okay, welcome back to the Bitcoin Knowledge <coughs> Podcast. Uh, we have a tremendous interview today with Brian Donegan. He's heading up digital business for the Iowa Man government. And it's his second time on the podcast to give us an update on what's going on over on the island. Uh, welcome to the podcast, Brian. Thank you, Trace. Glad to be here. Yeah, so last time you were on the podcast, just about a year ago, uh, there were a bunch of these promises about we're going to have regulation, we, we want to court the Bitcoin industry. Uh, maybe you can give a little bit of an update on, like, have you guys actually followed through on that? Sure. Well, maybe if I could wind it back a little bit, Trace, and give you a little bit of context. Back in April, May time in 2014, we as a government made uh, an announcement that we were open for business, for digital business, and that uh, we felt that digital currencies were a good thing, provided they were used correctly. And we announced at that time that we would introduce the appropriate rails uh, for regulation that the industry could run on. And I'm happy to say that uh, we're just at the concluding part of that process now. That uh, process comprised two pieces of regulation. The first one was the Proceeds of Crime Act 2008, which was an existing piece of regulation that we amended to capture digital currencies. And the purpose of that really was for AML purposes. So we wanted to have one very, very strong piece of uh, anti-money laundering legislation. The second piece of regulation is entirely new. It's primary regulation, so we've just developed that. It's been approved by our upper and lower houses of parliament, and it's called the Designated Businesses Act. And it's uh, intended and designed uh, to give our regulator the access to the books and records of new registered companies coming into the Isle of Man. And in terms of the housekeeping, aspects of that uh, regulation. That is going to have an appointed day order of the 28th of October uh, by our uh, Financial Supervision Commission and the switch on date for the regulation is the 9th of November. So really from that mo moment or date onwards, uh, companies and entities that are suitably qualified can come into the Isle of Man and get registered for this type of business. And so the main thrust is you want to protect customer funds and keep crime out and attract this industry to the Isle of Man. Absolutely correct. The, the first uh, and foremost rule for all of us is to keep crime out and protect the consumer and protect the individual. Uh, so that was our starting point with this regulation and it's the starting point for all of our regulation. Now, with the Isle of Man, I mean, you're, you guys are serious about the Bitcoin industry. If we, if we go and look back a little bit about some of these different niches, there's, there's the hedge funds, there's the digital gaming, you know, online gaming. Maybe you could talk a little bit about how you guys as a government go about trying to court these different industries and bring jobs and economic productivity and what it's actually done for the island. Sure. So maybe I could um, best illustrate that by telling you what happened with online gambling or e-gaming as we call it. That is currently 15% of our uh, GDP in the Isle of Man, about 900 jobs. So it's a, a fantastic contributor to our exchequer revenues. Um, when we introduced the legislation 10 years ago, it was quite controversial because people have difficulties around the ethics of gambling anyway. And so online gambling is just an extension of that. The Isle of Man government at that time recognized the huge potential in terms of job creation and revenues to our exchequer and it basically came up with the objective of creating the best quality regulation that uh, could be created with a dedicated regulator. And we also made the objective, or put the objective in place, I should say, of going after the premium end of that business, of the online gambling business. As soon as we did that, uh, we attracted some very, very heavy uh, hitting clients, the likes of PokerStars, the biggest online poker site in the world, 
And then, of course, once we established that network or ecosystem, we suddenly found that lots of others followed them. And, uh, and so the rest is history. We've had a, a very, very successful uh, ecosystem build up around e-gaming on the Isle of Man. What, what, was, what was interesting to us, though, was that in relation to digital currencies, there's a strong correlation between digital currencies and the e-gaming world. And there's, and there's a very strong convergence going on between those two industries right now. So a year and a half ago, we started to get approaches from the digital currency world. We weren't chasing it. Uh, it chased us. And so it was very, very interesting to see that some of the parallels that were there in 10 years ago with e-gaming were there for digital currencies as well. So we had a lot of experience in terms of going through the evaluation process of wondering uh, whether this industry had, had legs in terms of potential viability for our economy. And we quickly established with the, the, the local industry and, and public and private sector together doing a collaboration that if we didn't actually recognize and uh, act on the opportunity that existed with digi the digital currency community worldwide, somebody else would. And we felt that we were eminently qualified as a jurisdiction to be able to capture the essence of the opportunity. And I think we're, we're well on our way to doing that now. We've already established a, a uh, Manx or an Isle of Man digital currency cluster. So we've got a combination of exchanges in there. We've got some fantastic consultants in the space. So mining is, is obviously a feature as well. But what's probably more exciting for us is the huge potential that exists with blockchain. And so the blockchain businesses that we're seeing coming to the Isle of Man are really just businesses to do, that are doing super clever things with the protocol, with the underlying blockchain protocol. And so for us, that's very much the future. Those businesses don't hold client assets necessarily, so there, there's no sensitivity around, uh, or there isn't the same sensitivity for those businesses around banking issues. So they're more likely to be, get um, favorable consideration for banking purposes for operational bank accounts because they're not holding any client assets. So it doesn't complicate the, the picture when banks evaluate their business model. Is that kind of becoming the, the demarcation line? Because I know like one of my one of my startups, Natagio, which was Isle Man Company, uh, we've had cease operations because we just didn't get enough uptake as an exchange and you know we've kind of pivoted over there. Uh, but we also, you know, we had our we had our bank accounts over there. I think with Capital Treasury Services, and then we didn't have our bank accounts. So like that's the end of that, you know. Sure. Is it is it the holding of customer funds that is kind of becoming the the demarcation line for whether the banks are are giving the bank accounts or not? I think it's user ID verification. If there is one issue, it's it, it's the user ID verification for banks. They have to have absolute proof in terms of. Who the, who the buyers and sellers are. So in terms of sanctions, compliance, there has to be a solution. And so I think uh, when it comes to banking, that's, that's really the issue for them. And while I say that we have exchanges in the Isle of Man, the exchanges that are in the Isle of Man are not put off by the fact that you know, there is no banking for exchanges. They are, go they are going to Eastern Europe and finding Eastern European banks that are happy to provide them with their operational bank account needs. What's crucially important for us, however, is that we see that in the fullness of time that uh, appropriate regulations will come in in the UK and Europe and worldwide that will effectively bring exchanges into the fold and into the community, but that's probably some time in the future. Crucially for us, uh, what, it, what it means to us is that businesses that are actually looking to establish in a jurisdiction are continuing to choose the Isle of Man, even though those exchanges can't get bank accounts in the Isle of Man, but they can get them elsewhere. That tells us that we're doing all of the right infrastructure design and the architecture design in the right way. And you're going to bat for them, right? I mean, you're, you're work, working with private industry, uh, working even with other governments, particularly the UK government, to try and expand the industry and, and have these banking services and, you know, just the industry as a whole legitimized. Yeah, that's true. And uh, in relation to the UK, well, we can't speak for the UK government. In the public domain, we know that the Exchequer in, or the Chancellor rather, in his Exchequer speech back in the early part of this year, announced that uh, the UK uh, felt, the UK government felt that digital currencies were a positive thing and that in the course of this parliament they would be going out to a consultation with private industry to understand how they might set the parameters for a framework for digital currencies in the, in the not too distant future.
Yeah, and my, my buddy uh, Peter Smith, he actually flew around with the chancellor on like a four-day trip around Southeast Asia because he's the CEO of blockchain.info and they wanted to have a blockchain company accompanying on this uh, this flight. So, you know, they're definitely waking up to the potential and the possibilities here. Sure. Do we see any parallels like from the past? I mean, I've got some friends that run hedge funds. All their hedge funds are based out of the Cayman Islands. Sure. Uh, when you think hedge fund, you think Cayman Islands. Yeah, sure. Is, is that what you want? Bitcoin, absolutely. Isle of Man? Yeah, absolutely. I, I, I think that we, we were very, very early adopters as a, as a jurisdiction into the, into the blockchain community worldwide. And I think that, that first mover advantage, if you will, is paying dividends now. I think people are associating the Isle of Man as a place to domicile businesses for, for, for all the right reasons. And I think there's also an understanding, I think, within the community that if you really want to have success in this, in this industry, you really got to submit to superior regulation. And I think the community view is that superior regulation exists in the Isle of Man. I mean, the Isle of Man's try. they're in the hedge fund courting world also. I mean, how, how did that really, how did the Caymans just become so dominant in their, their position in that particular market? I think we're going back into the into the, uh, the mists of time, but certainly several decades ago, as I understand it, the, the Caymans felt that they were very well aligned as a jurisdiction to present their credentials as a destination for the incorporation of investment funds. And uh, I think they went about it in a public-private sector partnership and did that in a coordinated, sustainable way in London and elsewhere. And through that diligence, I think, uh, managed to establish a, a beachhead in the inv- in the investment funds world. And, of course, it's paid dividends, as we know, over the last two decades or so. In the same way, we see Isle of Man is doing exactly the same thing. Isle of Man is very well aligned to the needs of the digital currency industry. Uh, Isle of Man has been busy over the last 12 to 18 months aligning itself to the needs of the industry, not through just regulation, but also through promotion by speaking at various international events and supporting the industry generally. Yeah, so I've got a, I've got a friend who I won't name mm-hmm. because he, he runs an exchange. They've decided to, to do business in New York. So he you know, submitted for the bit, the bit license, and I think it was... It was a huge application, just pages and pages of this application. And I was asking him about the process, like, you know, what what do you think of this process? Like, he was like, I, and this is pretty much a direct quote, quote, I had no idea the power of the government to stifle innovation and destroy wealth and creativity, end of quote. Because before before the bit license came out, he was very much oh well we need regulation we need to you know be working with the governments and stuff and sure. you know big part of the Bitcoin community is like oh you're just asking for trouble with that sure yeah can it swing both ways you know can can one jurisdiction introduce just these huge bureaucratic rules that drive business away and yet another jurisdiction be like hey we're going to be friendly we're going to work with with the private industry to craft the regulation and really try to try to grow and foster uh, the industry. And so, you know, is the Isle of Man going to be the beneficiary of of these, I guess you could say, stupider (laughs) jurisdictions? It's, it's, It's a very, very fine line. It's a very fine balance between getting the regulation right and also being open for business. We think the Isle of Man has has got it right. But it's set out uh, from a starting place of actually wanting to keep crime out and protecting the consumer. We've always done that and we'll always continue to do it. I think if if I may say that if we see our our regulation as as superior, then clearly the evidence that we've seen of late and certainly in the last six to 12 months is that superior type companies will, will submit to jurisdictions that have superior type regulation. Uh, I think that's probably the easiest way I could explain it. But it's 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 working extremely well for us. Yeah, and I mean some of the some of the top names in the Bitcoin space have have redomiciled or created subsidiaries already in the Isle of Man that I'm aware of. Where do you where do you see it going? Like over the next three to five years, is, is the Isle of Man really trying to become a tech hub? Or I mean, is Bitcoin just on the tip of the spear? But you just see this massive innovation coming from IT and technology, and yeah. you want to just foster all of it. Sure. I think the Isle of Man is unique in terms of the, the resources that it has available to 
uh, the IT industry. And we know about the uh, telecoms interconnectivity that's available in the Isle of Man, the masses of bandwidth, and the independent power supplies that we, we have from, from, uh, from gas resources that are imported. It's the combination of these things and uh, a, a very attractive tax regime that doesn't seem to exist anywhere else uh, to the same extent that's making the Isle of Man attractive to the tech world. To put it in, that into some perspective, if we look at 10 years ago, the tech industry in the Isle of Man was less than 5%. 10 years later, we find that uh, it's 25%, and 15% of that 25% is e-gaming or gambling online. That just gives you an illustration of how the industry is actually voting with its feet. It's, it's doing its due diligence on us, and it's deciding that you know, the Isle of Man is a terrific place to establish a business and, and grow a business. Yeah, and also, aren't you guys at the forefront of uh, enabling or allowing some of the test, testing to be done on new technologies? I think that 5G is going to be getting tested in the Isle of Man the first quarter of 2016. That's correct. One I mean, the, maybe you can talk a little bit well, about the importance of being on the very bleeding edge of these infra, uh, of sure. these communications sure. technologies. Sure. It's, it, it, it's really where I came into this picture originally because my uh, first uh, involvement with the Isle of Man was to uh, work with the local telecoms provider uh, to get involved on the testing of 3G on the Isle of Man. So that's, uh, that, that starts to age me somewhat. But the Isle of Man is a, is, a, is a perfect microcosm of the UK in terms of its demographics. And because of our closeness to the UK and the topography in the, in the Isle of Man, uh, it's a very good place to establish R&D programs. And in the case of 3G, it was a natural fit. The, the local incumbent at the time, Manx Telecom, built 27 base stations and had a uh, wide selection of uh, consumers myself included, who were equipped with, uh, with, with appropriate handsets, and we got involved in a, an R&D program over a, a, a long number of months. And it was on the basis of that research that technology was subsequently rolled out into the UK, uh, Europe, and worldwide. So uh, all, it all began in the Isle of Man. Yeah, I think it's interesting. You know, people just kind of take for granted the way that their computers work or their bandwidth works. But... I mean, this, this 5G, just to throw some numbers out there, I was reading, uh, it's supposed to be one gigabit per second mm -hmm. uh, mobile. Mm -hmm. And yet, you know, in the U.S., you're lucky to get 10 or 20 megabits with your landline. And so who's living in 1950s North Korea, <laughs> you know, with their, with their communications right. infrastructure being trammeled right. by regulation. <laughs> sure, sure. Well, an, an, anybody that feels that, uh, that they're, they're, they're not getting the, uh, the full service and attention that they deserve, please direct them to me and I'll be happy to help. <laughs> you, you'll roll out the red card. I'll roll out the red card. Especially if they're Bitcoiners. Sure. Well, we've, we've had a fascinating interview. It's been so exciting to see the Isle of Man executing on the regulation creating an environment, fostering, actively courting some of the, the brightest minds that are pushing forward innovation in some of the toughest areas of math, cryptography, and, uh, and computer science. So with us today, we've had Brian Donegan from uh, Digital Business with the Isle of Man government. Thanks so much for uh, giving us an update. Thanks, Trace. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. get a copy of the free Bitcoin guide at freebitcoinguide.com. Got a question or suggestion? Record your voice at bitcoin.kn. Don't be shy. To help the show, share bitcoin.kn with friends, post about it on Reddit, and otherwise spam the interwebs. Your iTunes comments and five-star reviews are very important to us. Please continue tuning in to the Bitcoin Knowledge Podcast, where we release interviews with the top people in the Bitcoin world. Now take some choline and let that Bitcoin knowledge consolidate.